Okay, we are doing a kind of a not quick fire like I did before. I did one previously. It was 20 questions in 20 minutes. Um, some of those questions I did pull from a couple of the articles that Aubrey and I are looking at today, but this is going to be much more of a detailed answer, um, actually more uh, thought out. I'll have more than on average 60 seconds per question to answer, and there will probably be a little bit of back and forth with uh, Aubrey and myself as well, um, but we will... Go ahead and get started. Um, we are we are down to today. Tiffany is not feeling well, and Jess decided that on her birthday she didn't want to hang out with us. Um, so, you know, whatever. Um, I'm not going to take it personally. She just may not be invited back on, but. We'll see. Dinner, dinner over talking about Jesus. I'm priorities, Jess. Priorities. Okay. So this uh, first article, um, and I'll try to remember to link these articles actually in the description. But first article is ten common misconceptions about Christian life. Um, okay, I'll read this first question. And I'll let you decide if you want to take the first swing at it, Aubrey, if you want me to. And then just whoever starts off on the first one, they can go first in the second one and we'll, we'll mm -hmm. keep going that way. So first question, once you become a Christian, God will solve all of your problems. You want me to take that one? <laughs> um, I can speak on it for a minute. Okay. Uh, so aren't, sorry, question. Aren't there like yeah. two very similar ones? Do you want to hit them in the same thing? Because it, one says, once you become a Christian, God will solve all your problems. And the other is um, bad is things the, happen yeah. to Christians. Yeah, you, we can, we can. Same? Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. So, I mean, actually, uh, the Bible talks about how, uh, Jesus says that persecution will come. And honestly, it's, I've heard it said that, like, if you do not endure hard times or do not endure persecution, you should probably be worried um, because that means the devil is not scared of you. And <laughs> I've heard it said like that. And I just feel like that's so true because, uh, um, I mean, the enemy, he wants to take you out. And it's and it's not always the enemy. I'm not trying to say everything is um, persecution because not everything is. Sometimes it's literally just life or it's bad decisions you make um, because mm -hmm. there's a stewardship that's on our part as well that we're not going to get everything perfect and we shouldn't expect everything to come out perfectly just because we are a Christian. Um, but yeah, I mean... The Lord says that we you will be persecuted, you will endure trials. Yet in James, I believe it's James, he says that um, to in, consider it joy. Kind of joy, yep. Um, James one two, I think. Yeah. So he's saying that troubles will come, and when they do, just consider it joy because he's our strength and he's going to get us through it because it's what he does. <laughs> yeah, and so. Uh, kind of to piggyback on that point, um, you know, if I'm, I'm kind of a, a history buff, uh, especially like World War Two, World War One, Civil War. Um, but if you look at those, you look at the strategy that was involved in really any major battle. Um, you always want to focus your, um. Oops, kicked my mic. You always want to focus your firepower or focus your troops or whatever it is where your enemy is the strongest um, or where there's the biggest possibility 
for the, your enemy to take ground or, or things like that. Now, um, you know, there's, uh, a lot of things that went into this, but on, uh, again, in World War II on D-Day, when we landed on the beaches on Normandy, it was very bad, but it actually could have been a lot worse. And the reason it wasn't is because, um, there was Hitler and the, I think it was just mainly Hitler, but they actually were expecting an attack somewhere else because of some decoy military stuff that we had out there. And so they had a lot of their military moved away. And so we were actually able to take a lot of ground um, without the full force of the uh, Nazi German army because the enemy's focus was away to where they thought the biggest threat was. Um, and so, I mean, that's just common. Even if you're outside of that context, um, if you're looking at, you know, the uh, playing a game or, or something like that, you know, we'll play games with, uh, me and Tiffany and the kids. And if it's a game where, where I have to, uh, let's say you take players out or something like that, like smash brothers, uh, Mario super smash bros is one we play a lot. Typically I will try to focus on Abel before anyone else. And the reason why is because Abel is the biggest threat. Like Abel is, ridiculously good and so i intentionally put my focus on him because i know if i can get him knocked out my chances of winning go up quite a bit um not saying that he's the only threat or anything like that but and then uh uh kind of to throw in there with james too um so i i started doing an in-depth kind of in-depth study on james when we were originally talking about doing our Bible study with James and I looked up in James to um, those uh, the words um, where he says consider it pure joy when you're faced with tribulation of any kind and that word joy is also used um, so the Greek word I don't remember what the word is but it's also used in the New Testament when it's talking about um, uh, who is it? Mary and Mary, when they're running from the tomb, when they realized that Jesus's body wasn't there, the stone had been rolled away. His body wasn't there. And the angel had told them that he was alive. Mm -hmm. That is the word that was used. And so it's not just like a, like, you know, casual, Oh yeah, I'm getting persecuted. So that means I'm good. Like, like it's a, active enthusiastic like um i know this is happening because because i'm i'm solid in my faith i know this is happening because i'm digging in deeper and i'm trying to get more of god and so um you know i can expect this i can expect that that uh not only is this going to happen but i'm going to end up seeing fruit as a result of this mm -hmm. um and so that's i think <laughs> I don't, I don't know where this idea, actually, no, I'll, I'll strike that. I do know where this idea comes from. Um, I think the whole idea of, you know, all your problems are going to be solved and it's going to be great. I, I think that comes very heavily from the, um, word of faith movement or the, uh, it's called the name it and claim it movement. I've also heard it called the blab it and grab it movement, which I like better, um, but the whole idea that, you know, God wants you healthy, wealthy, and blessed. Um, and that may not always be the case. You know, there's, if we look at, uh, a scripture that's commonly quoted out of context, Philippians 4.13, um, Paul says he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. And what he's referring to is he's been in situations where he's had a lot and he's been in situations where he's had nothing. Um, he's been free. He's been in prison. He's had plenty to eat. He's had nothing to eat, but he knows that no matter what circumstances he goes through, he can persevere through those circumstances because God gives him strength to persevere. Um, but the common defining thing we see from Christians really throughout history is suffering. Um, and 
you know, how do we overcome that? How do we get through that? I think, uh, again, Paul puts it really, really well when, uh, I think it's Paul. Um, he says that, you know, he doesn't even consider the, the present circumstances to be compared to the glory that is to come. And I think having a, a, uh, healthy understanding, uh, and grasp on, on what it really is at stake. We've talked about this before, but if you really believe that there is an eternity and people that are away from Jesus are going to go to hell, then you are literally the worst kind of person if you do not tell people that. But also, it really helps for you to be grateful and to be able to persevere through hardships and, and times like that, understanding that, you know, like... I, I tell this to my kids a lot too, when they start getting scared about stuff like with storms and things like that. Abel is, um, he gets scared quite a bit with storms, but you know, I tell him worst case scenario, you die and you go get to be with Jesus. And I think about that as the worst case scenario, you get to be with God. Um, so it's, it's definitely not true. Um, we're told throughout the Bible, it is not true that, uh, we will have suffering, um, but we can get through it. Mm. Um, anything else you want to add before we jump on the next misconception? Nope. nope. All right. Um, next one, becoming a Christian means giving up all fun and following a life of rules. I'll, uh, I'll jump in on this one first. So, I think this is, I don't, I don't know. I don't even get like, unless you just see, unless you think the only way to have fun is just complete debauchery. Um, I don't see how that can be the case. Um, mm -hmm. so as far as like fun, you know, I, I think for me personally, the most, most fun, the most enjoyable moments that I have had have been as a parent with my kids, um, playing games with them, like doing stuff with them. Um, and so, I mean, you get to do that as a Christian, um, you're encouraged to do that as a Christian more so, especially in our, our current society. Um, now, as far as the rules go, I've, I've heard this, um, I don't know if anybody listening is going to be familiar with um, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, but he has, uh, he, he's not a, well, I don't think he's a Christian. Um, he believes that there is a God out there somewhere. And I have seen, uh, he has actually broken down in tears just talking about the idea that if the Bible is true, if Christianity is true, and God really became man and came down here and went through that for him to spend it. Like, even though <clears throat> he doesn't a hundred percent believe it, um, just the thought of if that's true, he broke down, like broke down sobbing, but he has a really good analogy. Um, <clears throat> when people talk about, you know, we need to just get rid of all rules and that's how you can have real fun and, and stuff like that. Um, and so he'll say, okay, let's play a game. There's no rules. And they're just like, okay, well, we'll play that game with you. And he says, okay, there's absolutely no rules to this game. You go first. And they just, I mean, they don't know what to do because, you know, if you think about it, like anything that we do that is, is fun. Um, you know, if you want to look at chess, if you want to look at, um, uh, I talked about video games already, um, football, baseball, um, you know, we, uh, right before we ended up moving, we ended up, we, uh, the four of us, me, Aubrey, Jess, and Tiffany went to a, uh, Braves Cardinals game in St. Louis and it was fun. Um, it was very energetic there and we were able to observe what was going on and we were able to clearly see that the Cardinals were getting just completely destroyed. And the reason why we were able to clearly see that is because there are well-defined rules that the Cardinals cannot live up to. Um, they, they just, they can't. 
And I don't care that the Cubs are doing horrible right now too. The Cardinals are, and that's that's good enough for me. Um, now I'll get off my uh, my uh, Cubs soapbox, but um, just the whole idea that you know having rules means that you can't have fun is it's completely contradictory to 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 life in general. Um, yeah, I'll let you go ahead, Aubrey. Uh, yeah, growing up a, uh, pastor's kid had a, a lot of rules in my household. And honestly, I followed them to a T because that's just the type of person that I am. I'm very routine and OCD and a perfectionist. And I was very scared of my parents too. So that had a lot to do with it. Um, However, when I actually encountered the Lord, like, you know, I was suffering before that through uh, suffering. Um, I, <laughs> like, I, I can't say that it was an extreme case of depression, but I was very sad all the time. And I had anxiety. And um, when I met the Lord, like, I encountered a joy like I had never had before. And it wasn't all of the rules, as people say, um, weren't really rules. It was just like, I don't have a desire to live outside of it because my desire is to please my father. And so why would I do anything different? And uh, which also, like you said, like um, they, they say Christians can't have fun, but that just means what do you consider fun is doing all of these, <laughs> you know, evil things like getting drunk and partying and uh you know and all of you know these other things that like people consider fun just because actually some of the most fun people i've ever met in my life are the best evangelists and pastors that you will hear and it's because they live in the joy of the lord like they recognize the joy of their salvation they recognize the joy of the Lord's presence and they live in that they live in daily communion with God. And one of the most, actually not one, the most joyful person that I ever walked on this planet was Jesus, obviously. Um, before joy was ever thought of or determined by man, joy like was determined by Jesus. It was determined by God. Um, so if you look at it that way, they are the standard of what joy is. So when you're living in daily communion with Jesus, when you're living in daily communion with the Father, um, you are going to produce the fruit of joy. It is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's not something that you just work on and that you just do. It's just something that's like birthed out of you because you are spending time with the one who is joy, the one who is joyful. Um, and it's the recognition that he lives in you um, and that, he saved you and that he's worthy and that should make you joyful just in that. And the thought that I, the most fun people that I know are all saved people. <laughs> Honestly, every unsaved person that I know all suffer with depression. Like they all suffer um, with loneliness or they suffer with anxiety and all of these things. It's because they haven't met this man that can, produce joy in them like they've never felt before. Like the world thinks they're in, um, they are experiencing joy, but like when they meet Jesus, they're like, oh no, like this is real joy. And so the, the thought that Christians can't have fun um, is definitely not true. I've never been more joyful than after I met Jesus and really, really encountered him. Yeah, um, I think that's good. And uh, oh, that's a point for another time. I'll come back to that later. Um, uh, okay, we'll go on to the next one. And this one, again, there's actually two that I thought are pretty similar. And so we'll throw these two together as well. And it's um, all Christians are loving, perfect people. And then... Christian churches are always safe places where you can trust 
everyone. Hmm. Do you want to jump on that one first, Aubrey? Sure. Um, when when I go out on evangelism, any person that I've ever talked to, um, if they grew up in a Christian church or they know about Jesus, a lot of times their response for not wanting to have a relationship with Jesus or be Christian um, is because they were hurt by the church or and or there's a bunch of Christian hypocrites that they've met and they don't want to be anything like them. So they choose not to follow Jesus because of these people. And that is, you know, you know, I'll just say it. This is this might get me canceled, but <laughs> like, you know, people like to talk about racism when you can't judge like you can't base one person um, and then judge the entire race for it. In the same way, as a Christian, you cannot judge one person that claims to be Christian and judge the entire Christian population for it in the same manner. You cannot do that. Um, that is definitely not true. Honestly, I always, when I encounter these people, my first response is, honestly, they probably weren't even Christian. <laughs> um, because a yep. true Christian will have the fruit. You know, Jesus um, says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the gates of heaven. And not everyone that casts out a demon or prophesies in his name will enter the gates of heaven. It's those that bear the fruit. And so the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, so like if they are not bearing that, then, I mean, point blank, period, they're not going to enter the gates of heaven. They're not, they're not a true Christian because the disciples of Jesus are going to look like Jesus. They're not going to be perfect. No one can be perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Like they're going to be flawed. And I think it's also leaving room for people to be flawed because we are all human. It's just like when you go to a church, when your pat if your pastor messes up, obviously if it's like majorly heretical and like, you know, like if it's a super big deal that does not align with the Bible and like, then you should probably leave the church. However, if it's like as a pastor's kid, if people judge what I did based on my dad, like if I messed up and lied about something, like you need to leave room for flaws because everyone is growing and everyone is flawed. And it's something that they need, they're going to need correction. And if they go and repent, then that's when you definitely stay at the church. If they're repenting, if they're repentive people, but you also have to have leave room for people to be flawed, to be, people to be flawed because no one is perfect. And so yeah, not the stereotype that Christians are hateful and mean. Um, they're probably not Christians if they are living in un that unrepentive sin of that bad fruit that they are bearing. Then they are not Christians. Yeah, um, I would agree. I think there's there's been a few times I've heard that. Um, you know, the church is just all all christians are hypocrites or the church is full of hypocrites or last time i went to church it was nothing but hypocrites um and my usual response is well it sounds like those people needed to be in church um but that's typically so i've also seen uh rebuttals from people like that would be the same thing as saying well, i'm not going to the gym anymore because there's all these fat people there that are trying to lose weight like Okay, <laughs> the church is meant for people that are hypocrites, um, for people that are self-righteous, for people that are um, addicts, for all of this. And so, mm -hmm. like, that's the whole purpose of the church is for them to... Now, I, I get what, what people are usually saying is they were holding me to a standard that they weren't living to themselves. Um, now, as far as that goes, yes, that is a problem that has been in the church for a a very long time um and even as far back as the the early early church i think we see some evidence of that um you know like uh 
Well, you can see when uh, when Paul confronted Peter, um, Peter had uh, started talking with the Gentiles and and treating the Gentiles a certain way and letting them come in. And then the Jews came around and Peter went back to um, kind of sticking his nose up at the Jew, at the Gentiles. And then Paul calls him out in front of everybody. Um, it's not men's words either. And, uh, and so that's where I think that's something that um, if there is error, if there is issue, as a church, we need to be better about um, calling out our own issues and not leaving it up to other people to do. Uh, so this kind of makes me think of a lot of the stuff that's come out recently, like the, I don't remember who did the first one, but there's a, a Hillsong documentary. And then they've just recently come out with another Hillsong documentary, but this one they had Carl Lentz and they did his story. I haven't watched the the most recent one, but I did watch the first one that came out. And um, there was, there's, I mean, the stuff that was brought out, I think needed to be brought out, but you could definitely tell the people that they're doing it had an ax to grind against Christianity. Um, and I think it's sad that it's to a point where something like that has to be brought out and made public by, um, a, a secular news organization. Um, and I'll throw out here too, uh, cause we'll, I don't know, let's just make everybody mad at us. Um. So there's a, um, I'm not a big fan of, uh, Bethel and, and, uh, a lot of the stuff that they do. I think they have a lot of stuff that is well over crossing the line, but there is a, a book that it wasn't technically by Bethel, but it's by somebody that was in high up leadership there and it was endorsed by Bill Johnson. <clears throat> I read the book. I actually read the book with the intention of picking it apart because I was very aggravated at some of the things that were coming out of the book. Um, and so I, I got it, I got a copy, um, read through it. And one of the things that really um, it really bothered me with it. There was a story they talked about where um, the, uh, I'm trying to think of a way to tell the story without giving away who the author is or the book. Um, I'll just, I guess I'll just say it. It's a culture of honor by Danny Silk. And uh, there's a story in there where Danny is talking about how there's another church that reached out to him. And basically what happened was this worship leader was having an affair on his wife. Um, it came out. It was not public knowledge. Um, the wife found out about it and then she went to the church leadership about it. And so then they reached out to Danny Silk, like, Hey, what do we need to do here? And so, um, Danny Silk has them come in. He talks to the worship pastor and his wife and the church leadership and stuff one time. And this was, I'm going to guess an hour long conversation, maybe, maybe two. Um, but they talk and then he goes back. Um, the, tr the worship pastor, they're actually getting ready to go on it. His family's going on a vacation anyways. And so we had like a week or two off out of the church. So then he comes back and the pastor reaches out to Danny Silk and says, you know, Hey, he's, he's getting ready to come back. Um, our plan is we're going to announce this to the church, let them know what happened. Um, he's going to take some time off away off the stage. Um, but we want to know the best way to actually go about this. And Danny Silk basically told him, Nope, it's already been dealt with. You don't need to tell anything to anyone in the church. It doesn't, nothing else needs to happen. 
Um, he said that he is uh, remorseful for it, and so it just needs to be done with. And to me, that is 100% sweeping the issue under the rug. Um, I don't think you can have a one-hour conversation with someone and tell that you've never met before and be like, yep, they're completely remorseful for what they did, and they're never going to do it again. Um, in contrast, there was a, a thing came out fairly recently with uh, Matt Chandler um, with, uh, I think he's Flower Mound Church in Texas. Um, and it was a similar situation, um, except he did not actually have an affair. He was... There was a, a lady that had attended his church that had reached out to him and they started talking and it wasn't anything inappropriate. Um, his wife knew that he was messaging this lady and um, one of this lady's friends actually came up to Matt Chandler after service and said, hey, you have an inappropriate relationship with my friend and it needs to stop. So the first thing he does, as soon as this comes out, he goes and finds, because his church is, is run by a board of elders, and so he goes and finds the closest elder. He gives the elder his phone. As soon as this happens, he gives him his phone. He says, hey, this just happened. I don't think I did anything wrong, but I'm giving it to you. And then he went and found his wife and brought her into the loop too. So they ended up doing this investigation, and... Um, the church ended up, the elders ended up coming out and said there was nothing inappropriate with the conversation or with anything that was going on, but they did see concern with the frequency and the familiarity in which the conversations were taking place. So just that they were talking a lot and it had gotten to where it was just kind of casual conversation. Like there wasn't really a purpose in having the conversation except to just have the conversation. And so they said that at that by itself, maybe technically isn't wrong, but that's opening the door for something else. And so they advised that he step away and they said, you know, this should be a red flag. And if you can't notice that, then there's something going on where you need to step back. You need to um, really ground yourself back in the word and your relationship with God, and then you can come back. And so that's what he did. And he stepped away. I don't remember how long it was. It was a, a few months. He stepped away. Um, he didn't preach at all in that time. Um, I don't know how much he was like in office or anything like that. But um, I think that was there was no room for any scandal or anything to pop up because as soon as anything was brought to their attention, they dealt with it. They threw it out in public so other people could see it. Like they didn't throw out the actual like messages and stuff, but I mean, I, I have no reason to believe that the, the eldership is lying. Um, I think they know that if they are being deceitful, it's going to come out and it's going to end up looking a lot worse for them. So, um, in contrast, those are two situations where I think they're handled very different ways. Um, I think one is really, really good and one is really, really bad. Um, now with that and Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that video. We release new content every week, twice a week, once on Tuesday and once on Thursday. So don't forget to like and subscribe so you will always see the newest content we have coming out. If you want to, you can check out a playlist that's down here and it'll take you into another video of ours that we think you're probably gonna enjoy. Thanks, God bless.